Hey folks, and welcome back to GameSpot's coverage of E3 2016. We are almost done, but we've got a bunch of great games coming up. Uh, delighted to be joined by the pride of the Great White North, Capybara's own Nathan Vela. How are you doing, sir? That's a good intro. You like that? <laughs> yeah, I do, actually. Keep that. Great White North. Yeah, it, yeah. Sounds, it makes Canada sound pretty awesome. It's a it pretty is. cool place. It's pretty cool. Yeah. I like it a and lot. And there's some pretty cool games coming out of it. Uh, one of which you debuted here three years ago? Yeah. yeah. A long, uh, a, a while. Right. A friendly amount of time. A uh, unexpected amount of time, but right. a friendly <laughs> amount of time. Yeah, uh, we've been working on the game for a long time. We announced it uh, with Microsoft uh, in E3 2013. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thought we were going to finish it in maybe like 2015, uh, and as we were making this thing it just kind of took us in a different direction and we decided to give it a chance to kind of be what we thought it wanted mm. to be I mean it's, uh, whenever I talk about it like that I sound like it's like it sounds kind of strange to be like you have to let you have to find the game yeah and, but really what we found is that like giving our studio a chance to explore an idea usually results in better stuff mm. than if we try to just like eh, that no that's a good enough idea and like, nobody wants to play video games that are good enough ideas right We're really passionate about trying to explore something to its fullest and that, you know, sometimes it takes a little bit of time. But we're super excited. It's coming out this summer. We're very confident about being able to nail that date. We're working on all of the fun things that come with getting ready for launch already. Just taking a little break in I L.A. for a week. Yes, I, I am. Right. The whole rest of the company is working their butts off. But I'm just kind of like, oh, yeah, I'm, <laughs> ch I'm, I'm chilling. I'm just, no, I'm, I'm, I'm taking a little bit of vacay while I'm here because I love L.A. a lot. Right. So. And post E3, uh, you kind of need a little bit of a... Yes. You need to step away. Because it's like video game overload. So, well, maybe for you, sir, I just played my first video game of E3 literally five minutes ago. It was Headlander. It was fun. Oh, uh, I love Headlander. So, so I guess what, what was the big shift? Uh, like, what was it before and what is it now? Or is it so granular that we're, we're talking well, about? Well, no, there, there are a lot of small, like even just the survival component of it, the, the fact that you have to eat and drink and stay warm, those were things that like, we didn't really think much about when we were originally defining what the game was supposed to be. Mm. And for the first, you know, when we revealed it, those weren't really big gameplay systems. They weren't right. important. Um, crafting was there, but it wasn't the way that we've built it now where you have to find fire and water and make soup or stew like those things were things that sh kind of you know came to light but then there are bigger things like we always wanted to do single screen dungeons we always wanted to do uh, kind of a zoomed out camera but um, we didn't know how important the concept of light and dark were going to be in the game we didn't have the kind of focus on we wanted to make a game about exploration but we figured out through development that part of the fun in exploring is even just exploring a single level. Right. Um, and darkness and then having to figure out how to use your either your, your torches that you craft or your magical lantern, which is like the one kind of little piece of magic in the game. Yeah. Um, we had to figure out how to balance that and the game became more about these kind of conflicts the life and death and how we deal with dying in the game the conflict of you know light versus dark of of huge space versus a tiny character mm. um, and those things became refined and became more interesting to us and then we kind of just dabbled in it we said wh why not give it a shot um, while with the goal of creating something that kind of feels a little bit different and I don't think you can I, I think that if we didn't explore it it would have felt a touch different, right? Um, so yeah, the end result is a is a is a very big game about a very tiny character, yeah. um, and that's we're really happy with the fact that we took that time. We're really happy um, that that the fans were not the angriest; that they right. trusted us a little bit to kind of keep going. And the result is that we get to when we talk about it, we're talking about a project, a game, uh, an experience that we we feel pretty good about because mm. we took that time mm -hmm. for sure. Uh, sorry, Zwing, you were... Oh, I was going to ask, like, how did you decide, like, at what point the camera would be stopped, right? Like, yeah. it, it's quite far away. It right? is, mm. it is. Uh, so, uh, Chris, our creative director, one of the co-founders of the studio, like, back in 2008 or something, he was super into roguelikes, uh, and he was, like, kind of peeved that they were kind of not the prettiest things and that they were they're a very different style of game. Yeah. Um, and so he's really inspired by that. And at that same time, you know, we all, everybody on the Internet has a 1080p monitor or TV, <laughs> um, and we, th we were kind of sitting there saying, like, that's a lot of pixels. Yeah. What can you do with that that's not just higher resolution, you know, better textures, move camera closer. Mm. And so at the very beginning of the game pitch, he pitched 
the idea of pulling the camera back and, and making a game about teeny tiny little yeah. um, and, and feeling weak and meager and one hit away from dying, but then giving the player, uh, 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 making them nimble and giving them a, a move set that allowed them to do to, to kind of battle that that small scale. Yeah, it's wonderful. The sort of the fog of war, the surrender, makes it seem like there's so much possibility, sort of where you go. Uh, for so. people who aren't familiar with, with Below, so what what exactly? What's the elevator pitch for this? It's a, it's a yeah, roguelike. It's sort of it's a it's an adventure game inspired by roguelikes about exploration, about survival, and about discovery. It's a game where you play this tiny little character. We call them the Wanderer, just because we don't know. Um, and the Wanderer is arrives at an island with a sword and a shield, and and a backpack that you can put stuff in, and the very first time you arrive, you arrive with a lantern, and there is just one lantern in the entire game. Okay. Um, and so you, we hand you a controller, uh, and we say, there you go, go. Uh, we don't, there's no text, there's no tutorials, there's no kind of like narrative via somebody telling you what the narrative yeah. is. There is a narrative, but it's there for players to explore. And are you um, expecting people sort of in the guise of like something like Super Brothers Sword and Sorcery, where like the internet sort of corralled together and figured out a lot of the mysteries around this game? That is, that is the hope. Right. I mean, it's, not a, it, it's up to the players to decide if they want to do that. Mm. Um, and so because the way the game works is that uh, you're actually a new character every time you die. You're right. not playing the same character over and over again. You're playing a sequence of new characters arriving after the life of the last one. Um, you can build on those the successes of your past lives. Mm. Um, but because of it, you start at the beginning every time. But we're, we're building these systems that let players kind of uh, cheat let them kind of, whether it's through shortcuts or um, you can light a fire at a fire pit and shine your magic lantern on it and turn the fire pit into a single use checkpoint. Right. So essentially, if you have enough power in your lantern and you want to, you know, you've, you don't know where you are, but you think you're going somewhere interesting, you can create that checkpoint. Um, and if you die, then you can have a, you can basically quick travel to the point where your corpse is, pick up the stuff that you had, fi find the lantern that you might have dropped, yeah. um, and, and carry on. But you can only do it once. You need to then set another checkpoint. So the idea of like using, again, the whole idea is to make death something interesting in the game. It happens frequently, frequently because if you get hit, you bleed. If you don't stop yourself from bleeding, right. you die. Wow. So you're going to die. <laughs> uh, but death is a, is a piece of gameplay because you're building on the success of the last lives because you can find those shortcuts unlock those shortcuts and then never have to deal with that super hard part ever again because you already dealt with it in a past life is, is there a case in which somebody can get quite far deep somewhere die drop the lantern and then it's incredibly difficult for them to get it again absolutely but <laughs> there, there are other kind of I'm not going to say safeguards, but there are ways to supersede that extreme challenge yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah you don't need the lantern to at all times, but the lantern is critical to exploration in the game, mm. uh, and it will it not having it will sometimes stop you from being able to do certain things. So there is a balance. Uh, what another thing that you can do is at fire pits you can either cook to make your soups and potions, well, our equivalent of potions. Mm. Uh, you can go into this place that we call the pocket, which is kind of like a uh, like an old Final Fantasy style save zone almost, where right. you pull out of the game, you pull out of time inside of the game, and you can uh, leave your weapons, you can leave the lantern, you can stock nice. up items, and they're there for any other life. So you can kind of basically prepare for more challenging journeys when you're in the easier part of the game. Mm -hmm. um, and stuff left there can be picked up by any future character. Mm. So you can do things like set checkpoints, explore, or set checkpoints, go into the pocket, leave things, and then explore. And if you die, you know where your lantern is, <laughs> you know you have some supplies to go further, and you know you can get right back to where you were. If you're smart and if you're exploring with, with purpose. Right. It's quite morose. It's like, oh, okay, I'm probably not going to get much longer in this yeah. life. So I'll <laughs> yeah. just like pass this one down. Just bank all my stuff here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is what you're seeing right now is is the pocket area, and it's you know there's a fire, there's a place to hang your lantern, there's a little clothesline, there's oh, even a place to store your gems because you collect gems off of enemies that you kill, and they're the fuel for your lantern. They right. also have other purposes in the game as well. Um, so you can just kind of sit there in in the in the pocket and lounge. You can actually just sit by the fire and, and hang out if you want. Uh, you know. supplies only gathered from enemies or can you like you can you can enemies? scavenge for there's kind of a flora and fauna within the game right. the closer to the surface you are the more natural it is the more plants and animals there will be and then the deeper and darker it gets the more weird those mm -hmm. items become um, and you can you know you can find everything from potatoes to cabbage to you can <laughs> kill bats and harvest meat from them you can <laughs> 
wow. you know, you can you can kind of you can do a, you can harvest stuff from uh, humanoid enemies like cloth and leather, right. um, and those are all pieces of the crafting. And I mean, are those it, recipes like the, I'm guessing there's no like cook cookbook in this. That's all like p people are gonna discover that themselves as yeah, well. Yeah, we're we're. Like any, uh, I mean, I don't know if if you guys cook. I, I personally like to cook myself, mm. and, and and when I'm you make soup, terrible. you put like some stuff in a pot, yeah, and you dump a bunch of things in it, and you mm -hmm. boil it for a while, and kind of no matter what you put in there, it kind of makes a soup, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> that will always you, we will always be able to make something at least that will deal with hunger and thirst, and nourish give you, you a little right, bit of health. Okay. Yeah. Might but not taste too good. Yeah. But that's <laughs> and, and it's definitely not going to give you buffs. <laughs> It's right. definitely not going to heal your bleeding all the way. Uh, those are all saved for the bigger kind of special recipes, and those are for players right. to find. Are, are the recipes something like when you discover a recipe per se, does it save to something that you can refer back to later? We're still kind of sorting out that piece of the puzzle, to mm. be totally honest. We're, we want it to be uh, not something that you can just kind of like... You know, we want the list of craft. In the ideal scenario, the list would be shared amongst players, right? Rather than being defined by us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is kind of like that might actually be super friggin' frustrating, and we might just kind of let you do that. Oh, um, I think that's but great. I'm a huge <laughs> fan of like playing some games with a piece with of paper. With a notepad. Right. Yeah. Oh yeah, God, yeah, yeah. Same. <laughs> I did that. Uh, I don't know if you guys played Device Six on iOS by some yes. logo. Uh, I have like drawings, and same thing with the witness. The witness. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah, totally. Uh, so we're. I mean, you know, we don't. We're, we don't want to obligate anybody to do that. But mm. that's, again, there's, we have these kind of like, we have these ideas in the game, and then we have the ideal scenario of people playing it. Um, whether or not they do, that's totally up to them. They can right. play this game however the heck they want. Um, but it'd be really rad to see people's. If, if you take notes while playing our game, please send them to <laughs> us oh so man. we can see them. Awesome. Uh, we've got a bunch of questions coming in I want to get to. Scrubby Cat asking, uh, Co-op, do you guys have any multiplayer plans here? Uh, it's a single-player game. Uh, that's something we would, we would really like to think about. Mm. But for now, we're really focused on what the single-player experience is. It's a game that like again as we kind of worked on it we realized the feeling of of scale really merges well with the feeling of loneliness Isolation, and, yeah, and, yeah. and you know the weight of the world being on your shoulders um and so yeah it's a, it's a single player experience but it's something that like obviously you know we're it's it, it's in the head it's in yeah. the brain you well, don't want to push this one out another year yeah, yeah, we yeah, uh, yeah. If uh, if Scrubby Cat would like to fund the delay, we <laughs> right. would absolutely. <laughs> um, I guess I, I'm sort of interested in how. I mean, indie studios are usually pretty scrappy, right? Like trying to like hustle to get the next game out. What is it about Capybara that allowed you guys to like be able to like take a like a intake of breath and be like, you know what, actually. We'll just leave this one be another 12 months. Like, put that time in. Um, well, I, I mean, part of it is we've had some games that have done well enough that give us the financial freedom mm. to do that. But the other part of it is, like, we just, we understand that our best chance of making games that matter to people is by making them as good as possible. Right. Um, and that, that, that is a firm, like, that is just the way that it works to me. Yeah. Um, I think that's the way that, that player, that's what players expect from smaller uh, more kind of air quotes creative games. Yeah, they yeah. expect something to be fully realized. They don't want half baked cool little games. They want fully baked cool mm. little games. Yeah. Um, the bigger games they can they play in a space where they have to be complete and tight. Yeah. We have the ability to be a little bit looser. Uh, I'm getting I'm at your piece here at the moment and I've, I'm actually privy to all the wonderful music that's playing. Uh, Jim Guthrie again? <laughs> yes, Jim Guthrie back in the, he has like 200 minutes of music for this game. We have no right. idea what we're going to do with all of it. Uh, fans of Jim Guthrie uh, know him from Sword and Sorcery from Indie Game the Movie. Mm. Um, he also uh, has done a bunch of other work and is in, you know, back in Toronto is kind of an indie rock legend. Uh, but the soundtrack for this game is very different. Uh, Jim is a, a, a genius, and a big part of the game is the ambience, is the tone, um, and his music, instead of coming in and just being like, amazing Jim song by amazing Jim song, <laughs> right. it's this kind of like <laughs> mixing his beautiful songs with a, a longer soundtrack. I think it's really, really rad, and I can't wait for people to hear the whole thing. Nice. Uh, Nathan, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for having uh, me again. Last thank question, you. have to ask you, were you responsible for releasing that capybara in Toronto? They found one of them.
They found one? They found one. Oh, really? Yeah. They found the male. The, the, the lady capybara is still at large. Oh, no. oh my uh, God. Yeah, I kind of wish that I was in hindsight because <laughs> that would have been the best marketing of all time. <laughs> yeah. You got a freebie. Yeah, we did. Thank you very much, Toronto Zoo. For an, <laughs> or, Toronto High Park Zoo. Okay. The, the full zoo, is, this is just a little tiny little. Oh, right. They have zoo wars in Toronto. Oh, absolutely. You, wow. don't, you, don't, you don't get in it's the middle intense. of that. It's kind of like, yeah, it's, it's like Mafia 3 except zoos. <laughs> <laughs> and Nathan Valor, thank you so much for coming in. When is thank Below you. available? Where can people find it? more about it. Uh, whatliesbelow.com It's coming out this summer. We should have a, a firm release date very soon uh, because the summer is actually just starting in yes. a couple of days and it's only three months long. So yeah. that window is, is, is locked and loaded. Uh, it's coming to PC for Steam and Xbox One as well. And we're super excited to finally get it into players' hands awesome. and to stop talking to you about it. <laughs> right, yeah. Let's talk about <laughs> a new game next year. Uh, you know what? We, <laughs> we got some stuff cooking and I'm super excited about Good it. Stuff. Ooh, uh, good stuff. Thanks so good much stuff. for coming in. Uh, thank you folks for watching. Uh, we've got a bunch more Great games coming up here as we wrap up our final day on the Electronic Triple Show floor. Next one up, a game I'm very much looking forward to talking to the developers about. It's Ukulele. Be back in two minutes.